Uh, for the next few Sabbaths, three actually, we're going to look at a, a very, very famous Seventh-day Adventist minister. Maybe some of you are going, well, he's not that famous. I've never heard of the guy. Well, um, once we get done, you will see that indeed Dudley Marvin Canwright was probably one of the top ten most famous Seventh-day Adventist ministers. You know, folk, before we have prayer, I just want to say, uh, Cody and Hilda recently, they said, are you ever going to get back and do some more of those uh, character, you know, looking at different leaders in Adventism that you did on Kellogg and, and Wagoner and Jones? And I thought, boy, you're right. I haven't done that in a while. And so I thought, maybe Cody or Hilda mentioned Can Wright. But um, so I started doing this study on him. And folk, I find the studies to be so enriching because there are elements as I'm reading about his life and I'm reading about the counsel Ellen White gave him. And boy, folk, it just, you know, the Lord brings it home. He brings it home. And so... That's why we do these little sketches of these different characters. I know studying about Jones and Wagner, um, very, what a blessing. Uh, they often come back to my mind, what we studied together with those men. And I, and I firmly believe that as we study about Dudley Canwright, there's going to be some things that the Lord's going to bring back uh, to our minds with this study as well. With that in mind, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your law that is absolute. Thank you that with your grace we can walk within the boundaries of that law. And thank you that in that experience, uh, we're free. We're free not to go crazy, but to walk in perfect peace because your law is within our heart. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. We pray for the Holy Spirit to teach us to humble us today, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, with all these people that we've studied, whether it be Wagoner, Jones, Kellogg, and now D.M. Canwright, there is, there is a thread there's a thread that weaves through every one of their lives. And it's, the principle is in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. Uh, Galatians 6 verse 3 and then verse 7 and 8. Uh, and if we forget this, folk, well, we might as well just pack it in. Galatians 6 verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Now, you know, in, in this era of, of um, you know, self-worth and self-esteem and, and all that self-stuff, we say, well, Galatians 6, verse 3, that's not about self-esteem. Well, no, it isn't. Because the whole point, folk, is when we think we're something, well, what can God do in our lives then? We don't need him. We don't need God if we're somebody. And Paul says if we think we're something, when we are really nothing. Now, why does Paul indicate that we are nothing? Well, folk... 
if we recognize that we're nothing, well then, who are we going to be depending on? Who are we going to look to? We're not going to be looking inside anymore because we realize what inside produces. So we're going to look outside and our eyes will be riveted on Jesus who alone, who alone, as Jude 24 says, now unto him who is what? What's he able to do? Keep us from falling. And to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Folk, we must recognize that we are nothing. So we will depend on the one, Jesus, who is everything, who can then prepare us for his coming. Paul goes on, he says, if a person thinks they're somebody, they're deceived. E.J. Wagoner, through all the accolades and praise that were poured upon him, he became self-deceived. Led him into that, what we sit back today and we go, that guy was crazy. From 1888 and righteousness by faith to 1898, but 10 years later, and he's saying, my secretary is going to be my wife in heaven. And E.J. Wagoner had the audacity to write to Ellen White and say, God has given me new light. He called that light, folks. He said, this is from heaven. And Ellen White wrote back to him and said, Brother Wagner, I don't want to have anything to do with your light. She said, the devil has gotten a hold of your head and I want nothing to do with you. Folk, self-deception. That's what Laodicea, come on. Laodicea, we say we're rich and increased with goods. We don't need anything. Our constant prayer has got to be, Lord, save me from myself. Save me. Save me from trusting in. And excuse my English, but save me from my stupidity in thinking that I'm somebody. Save me from that. Paul goes on in Galatians 6, he says, Don't be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Folk, there's a reward. <laughs> there is a reward. At the end of the line, for whichever path we choose, if we sow to our flesh, there's a reward. There's a consequence. It's corruption. But there's also another road. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So we have that choice. And every day we have that choice. You know, <laughs> recently I was in the uh, post office and uh, just out of the blue, one of the clerks, out of the blue, just blew me away. One of the clerks said, um, she looked at me, she said, uh, you're losing your six pack. Excuse me? <laughs> I went away. I went to Publix. I was over there picking up something. Hadn't weighed myself in a long time, and I thought, six pack? 
God on the scale. What? I weigh that much? I'm grateful that that individual said that to me. Hit me right between the eyeballs. Folk, we need to be hit between the eyeballs. We need to be hit between the eyeballs. Unfortunately, when Dudley Canwright was hit between the eyeballs, he fought it. He spent the rest of his life going after the gracious woman who dared to say, Dudley, you've got some things wrong. And of course, that woman was Ellen White. Let's take a look. Dudley can write. Dudley can write with probably right up there with Jones and Wagner as a powerful preacher who eventually left the Advent message and became one of its most ardent foes. He wrote a book in 1889. Remember that date, folks. He wrote a book in 1889. It was called Seventh-day Adventism Renounced. Since it normally takes several months and sometimes years for a book to be written, Canwright was penning this tirade against Seventh-day Adventism during the time when the 1888 session was transpiring. Sunday laws were being advocated in Congress and the latter rain was starting to fall. Now, is that blindness? That's scary, isn't it? Jones and Wagner were preaching. Ellen White said, the latter rain is falling. The latter rain is coming down in torrents after the 1888 message. Jesus is about to come. Sunday laws are being advocated in Congress. And Dudley can write is writing a book. He's leaving Seventh-day Adventism. Wow. It was time, folk. It was time for the Advent message to go like fire in a hay field. The latter rain had started. Jones and Wagner had already preached. The Blair Bill was being advocated in Congress. Revelation 13 was happening in America. And Dudley Canwright was leaving the Advent message. Leaving the Advent message. And writing his famous book, Seventh-day Adventism Renounced. Strange infatuation. Strange blindness. How could he do that? How could he do that, folks? Jesus was about to come. The latter rain is falling, and Dudley Canwright no longer believes in the three angels' messages that he had preached for 20 years. What happened? What happened? Well, let's get a little backdrop. Now, there's a couple of books that you can find on the computer. Actually, there's two books and one article from which I got all this information. One is a book by a lady named Carrie Johnson. I have it back in my bookcase. It's called I Was Canwright's Secretary. That's one of the books. Another book is by D.W. Revis. It's called I Remember. The third is a pamphlet put out by Vance Farrell from Pilgrim's Rest, and it's called The Man Who Took the Phantom Ship. So it's from those three documents that we get this information. This statement's from the foreword to the book, I Was Canwright's Secretary. 
Mr. Canwright was a Seventh-day Adventist for 28 years an ordained minister of the church for 22 years, serving largely as an evangelist, but filling executive and other positions as well. From the time the 1867 diary jottings reveal in his experience periods of victory and confidence and reoccurring periods of doubt bordering on atheism. The Adventists found him to be a man of strength, but plagued with recurring periods of questioning and discouragement, at times resulting in his laying down his ministerial duties and resorting for a time to agricultural activities. Man, folks, Dudley Canwright, Dudley Marvin Canwright, was a man of terrible extremes. He could be as high as a kite, preaching the three angels' messages. And then he could be in the, in the throes of despondency and despair, ready to leave Seventh-day Adventism. Dudley Marvin was born in Michigan, Kinderhook, September 22, 1840. Four years before the Great Disappointment. His dad, Hiram, rejoiced visualizing a muscular youth helping him in the fields and at some future date taking over the farm. A Dudley Canwright was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist. He was converted to the message. He said he heard Brother James White's sermon on the first day or Sunday. There, he came to the conclusion to keep the Sabbath of the Lord. And by his grace assisting me, I have enabled to do so. That was in the Review and Herald, the Adventist Review, January 26, 1860. Some years later, in recounting his experience, he told Cottrell, how he listened to the preaching, devoured Adventist books, studied his Bible day and night. He was an enthusiastic believer and longed to convert others to his newfound faith. An item appearing in the issue of December 30, 1862 from the Review, three years after his conversion, revealed his studiousness, his earnestness, his hopeful spirit. I've heard most of the objections that infidels and worldly professors can raise against the truth, yet these have only increased my faith in the message by showing the spirit of its adversary and the utter foolishness of their arguments. Oh, how good the truth is now when we see the signs predicted by our Lord as the harbingers of his return to gather his people, fulfilling in quick succession and know that the hope of God's children is so soon to be realized. I deeply feel the need of a pure heart. How little we generally realize the importance of keeping ourselves pure and unspotted from the world. May God help the remnant to seek meekness that they may be hid in the day of the Lord's anger is the prayer of your unworthy brother. Now I want to ask you a question. How many of us could have written that? How many of us could have written the same thing? Oh, I could have. Canwright wrote that in 1862. He says, it doesn't matter how many people I hear come against the truth. The truth is still good. It's good. He wants a pure heart. He wants to keep unspotted from the world. He wants to seek meekness because he is unworthy of the grace of God. Wow. We could have, all of us could have written that. <laughs> all of us. Canwright felt called to the ministry. 
He went to speak with James White in Battle Creek. Says it was not surprising when about 21 years of age in the early 1860s, Canwright went nearly 40 miles to Battle Creek to talk with James White about entering this line of work. Elder White recounted the experience a few years later. He came from cold water to talk with me on the subject of preaching. I spent about an hour with him. I said to him, do not content yourself with being a small preacher, but be somebody or die trying. Do not go out to be a pet, but go out into the field with the weight of the work upon you with steady principles. Stand your ground. The last thing I did was to present to him with one of our English Bibles and a pair of charts saying as I did so, here Dudley, take these, go out and try it. When you've become satisfied that you've made a mistake, bring them back. The next May at the conference, I met him and I asked him, what about those charts and the Bible? He replied, Brother White, you have lost them. Thank God, I would like to lose more in the same way. Folk, best way to describe Dudley Canwright at this point in his career in the early 1860s Dudley Canwright was on fire for the truth. He was ready to go preach the three angels' messages, Daniel and Revelation. He was ready, folks. He was ready. Notice Canwright's testimony. This is in the review, June 6, 1865. Listen again. This is incredible. Present truth looks clearer and more beautiful to us the more we study it, wrote young Canwright a few weeks later. Praise the Lord for a religion that agrees with the Bible, common sense, and the wants of man. Does he sound satisfied in the Advent message? Yeah, he does. Didn't need anything else. It was the truth, and he was going to hold it. November found him on his own in Indiana, giving 48 lectures in about six weeks' time to a crowded meeting house. Fifteen began to keep the Sabbath. Twelve subscribed to the Review and Herald. Forty dollars worth of books were sold. The meetings met with favor, and in an adjoining district, the people offered to furnish the workers with wood, lights, board. They could also enjoy a course of lectures. Late April of the following year, a conference meeting was held at Lovett's Grove, Ohio. That's where Ellen White had her great controversy vision in 1858. The workers there were dependent on Michigan for visiting speakers. They were overjoyed when Brother Canwright came to help them. Never in Ohio have we had a better conference than this, the review reported. One brother and his companion came three days to meet with us. They departed rejoicing in the hope, not regarding time or expense, that they might hear preach the word and mingle their devotions with the people of God was so fruitful a ministry. It's little wonder that Dudley Canwright was ordained to the gospel ministry when he was 24 years of age. On May 29, 1865, the ordination service was conducted in Battle Creek, Michigan by J.N. Loughborough and James White. 1865, he's 24, 25 years old, ordained to the gospel ministry by these pillars, Seventh-day Adventism, J.N. Loughborough, James White, ordained in Battle Creek, Michigan. Wow! Dudley Canwright was steeped. He was steeped in Seventh-day Adventist lore. 
just steeped in it, folks. Canwright was a great evangelist. Great evangelist. The Lord blessed his efforts. Canwright was a student of scripture, of history, of prophecy. And the Lord blessed his efforts mightily. When they went to New England, though, they had a different kind of response. J.N. Andrews went with Canwright. It says they labored, the people benefited from their ministry. They proved a great source of encouragement to the scattered Adventists. The people said our hearts have been much comforted by Brother Canwright coming amongst us and dear Brother Andrews, the first Adventist missionary, J.N. Andrews. That was in 1866. At least one Canwright reported a complete failure of his meeting at Canaan, Maine. Winter storm cold hearts, the natural conservatism of the people made labor in New England difficult. When J. N. Andrews returned to Nor Norwich Walk after a visit to New York, he heartily commended the zealous, devoted, and faithful labors of Brother Canwright, stated that during his absence, 18 joined the church. Between 30 and 40 took an active part in prayer meeting and tobacco had been banished from the ranks. 1867. Twenty years later, D.M. Canwright leaves the Advent message. What happened? What happened? Wow. From the Advent Review, April 23, 1867, says it was during this period certain perplexing weaknesses began to reveal themselves in Canwright's character. For lengthening periods of time, he would be deeply discouraged. Doubt would sweep over his mind. His belief in God would waver, and on at least one occasion, he veered toward atheism. A successful evangelist? Ready to give up Seventh-day Adventism? In a handwritten diary during 1867, Canwright said he almost doubted present truth. He wrote of his temptation toward exhibitions of pride, self-exaltation, and a spirit of harshness toward others. <coughs> What's that? Dudley Canwright had a, as people are saying, oh, you did a great job, Dudley. You're a great man. Dudley Canwright started to believe that. And he started to think that it was he that was great and not the Adventist message that was great. That's what happened. He became harsh toward other people. He once declared he was spiritually sick. He feared that God had forsaken him and was tortured with the thought that he would be eternally lost. He suffered from frequent headaches and often mentioned he was ill. But on the last day of that year, he wrote that God had saved him from falling and that he still trusted him. The year, he said, had been a mingling of deep sorrow and great joy. The happiest event of that year was his marriage. 
March of 1867, he said, I now go home to spend a few weeks in Michigan. Dudley Canwright, married in 1867, he would have been 27 years old. Married a young woman who at that point would have been 19 or 20. Her name was, was Lucretia. That was his first wife. How did Dudley Canwright feel about the spirit of prophecy? Always a key element in how people respond to Seventh-day Adventism? Well, here's a statement. Ellen and James White had been warmly welcomed and were staying in their home. Lucretia, Dudley Canwright's wife, unable to attend the meeting, stayed at home and saw that her guests were well cared for. Because she could not attend, her husband Dudley was hurt, even though he knew she had good reason for staying home. He often admitted he was too exacting with his young wife. At other times, he expressed dissatisfaction because he thought, she was not efficient in the performance of home duties. The young bride wept and Dudley resolved to be more considerate in the future. This is a fascinating statement right here, folks. Because about seven years after this experience, Ellen White wrote Dudley Canwright and Lucretia and she strongly encouraged and rebuked Dudley Canwright because Dudley felt that all the responsibilities at home rested on the wife. And Ellen White said, you, basically she said, you've got to get off your high horse. That a man is to share in the responsibilities and duties that take place in the home. It is such beautiful, practical advice. So Dudley Canwright would get real, real cruel with his wife. She would cry because Dudley was so exacting and said, You've got to do the stuff at home. You've got to do the dishes. You've got to take out the trash. You, you know. And Ellen White said, hey, buddy, get off your high horse. The young couple enjoyed the visit of the Whites, learned to love them, and expressed sorrow when they departed. The home crisis was not reflected at the conference, which was declared to have been a success. There was a crisis, folk, in the Canwright home because Dudley Canwright was above helping with what went on in the house. That is critical. And Ellen White came out later on and told Dudley Canwright so. It's important that men take a role in helping the wife at home. Thus closed the meetings of our first conference in Maine. Canwright reported there were some who professed to be in the message that would have given much to have been kept, to have kept brother and sister white away. They thought they did not need them nor their help, but thank God they came and came in the spirit of God, came just in time to save the cause from reproach and confusion. Never before did I so fully realize the great importance of the gifts in the church. Never did I have so strong faith in them as now. Thank God for the testimonies. As we look at D.M. Canwright's life, these statements right here, folk, were eaten many times over. 
because when Dudley Canwright came out with his book in 1889, Seventh-day Adventism Renounced, his chief, his chief emphasis in that book is against the spirit of prophecy. And the arguments that Dudley Canwright gave in 1889, he said that Ellen White was a plagiarist. He said that Ellen White received, did not receive visions, but she got information from other people. Folk, the same arguments that are used today to attack the spirit of prophecy had their roots in the heart of Dudley Canwright. That's where it all started, folk, back there with Canwright. But here Canwright is saying how important the gift, and he means the spirit of prophecy, is to the church. Thank God for the testimonies. He's talking here about the work of Ellen White. We realize that God has laid upon Brother White a work that no other man can do. The cause needs all the gifts, each one in its place. For myself, I never prize the gifts as now. Never love God's tried servants as now. So Dudley Canwright in 1867 said how wonderful and how thankful he was for the spirit of prophecy. Six to seven years later in the early to mid-1870s, Dudley Canwright changed his tune. Changed his tune. One of the people that was very close to Dudley Canwright throughout his ministry was the General Conference President of 1888, a man by the name of George Butler. They started working together in 1869 doing evangelistic work in the state of Iowa. We read in this quote from the review, this is in 1869 as we're going forward. It says, Canwright appealed for the prayers of God's people. Their prayers were answered. After eight weeks, he reported 35 Sabbath keepers in that place and a blue sky. Canwright now began working under the supervision of George Butler, president of the Iowa Conference. The two men were destined to labor for, many, for several years, first there, then in other parts of the gospel vineyard. During the conference, Canwright was placed on important committees. Now, it was in this time in 1869 that Dudley Canwright started and got involved in something that was very common during the 19th century, and that was debating. Seventh-day Adventist ministers were often challenged to debate Adventists and others in Iowa now learned what New England already knew in debate. Canwright was at his best. Dudley Canwright was an excellent debater. And oftentimes he would go up against spiritualists, people who, claim, who actually, as they would get up to speak, actually demons would speak through them. So... Canwright would go up against Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and many times it would be over the Sabbath, the spirit of prophecy, the state of the dead, and the sanctuary. But Canwright was excellent at debating. Reports appeared in the Review and Herald of victory after victory in these verbal contests. As scripture evidence became clear to the listeners, men and women cast in their lot with Seventh-day Adventists. It was used, folk, for the conversion of many, many people. The camp meeting held in Iowa in early October of 1869 brought Elder and Mrs. White and the Canwrights together again. 
Elder White reported, we found brother and sister can write on the work of the Lord and in the hearts of the people. May the Lord keep these his youthful servants from the influence of the world and the power of Satan and make them a great blessing to the cause in Iowa. And George Butler says, Brother Canwright spoke several times with great acceptance. In November of 1869, things are going well. Canwright is debating, winning many people to the Advent message. He's becoming well known in the church, becoming a very successful evangelist. But then something starts to show itself. In December, right towards the end of the year, can write in his late twenties. Something happens. In Monroe, Iowa, 40 people take their stand after evangelistic meetings that Can Wright held. On the 28th of December, he participates in a debate with an elder Johnson of the Presbyterian Church. The subject was life and death. Now, the elder of the Presbyterian Church admits he cannot meet Can Wright's arguments, and he gives up. Several joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Elder Butler is there. The two men share a room, probably in a hotel. Now, while they're there in the hotel, George Butler reports that Canwright was not in good spirits the night of his success. Butler was astounded to learn that the young man was under the powerful temptation to give up religion, renounce his belief in the Bible and become an out-and-out -out infidel. The two men all night talked and prayed. Neither slept. Butler reported that in the morning, Canwright seemed more calm and self-possessed. And at the general conference session in Battle Creek a few weeks later, he made confessions, seemed much relieved, and again threw himself zealously into the evangelistic field. What is going on in this man's head? Successful evangelist, powerful debater, winning, the Lord is using him to win people to the Advent message. And the meeting is over, and Dudley Canwright wants to give up Seventh-day Adventism. What's happening? As this story unfolds, it becomes very clear that Dudley Canwright was upset because he was not being exalted. Dudley Canwright was becoming upset with the Advent message because he felt that if he was of another faith, he could be far more popular. So it was all about the exaltation of himself. George Butler wrote many years later in the Review and Herald, December of 1887. Now this is what he wrote after Canwright had left the message. This is a little window into Dudley Canwright's character. Notice what he said, and Butler knew him very well. He was never noted for patience, forbearance, or regard for the opinions of others. That's scary, folks. Dudley had all the answers. He was a person who formed his conclusions quick and was inclined to be rash. And though in the main a genial, pleasant, frank companion, yet his desire 
to have his own way sometimes got him into trouble. He never could bear reproof with patience or feel composed when his way was crossed. When he came to mingle in important matters with brethren in prominent positions, these and other traits naturally got him into trouble. Dudley Canwright had little respect for anyone's opinion unless it coincided with his own. The reader can readily see that very naturally there would be friction. He always hated reproof, hence bore it like a fractious child. He had some unpleasant experiences as we well remember. Now see, the brethren understood that. George Butler understood that. And because Dudley Canwright did not like to be crossed, the brethren left him alone. But there was one person who didn't, and that was Ellen White. Because God gave her visions, and God saw the needs that that young man had. And Ellen White loved young Dudley can write enough to tell him that he was wrong. When everything was pleasant, he could see things with clearness. When he was abused, as he always thought he was when things didn't go to suit him, the evidences of our faith began immediately to grow dim. See, Dudley Canwright's faith and his belief in the Seventh-day Adventist truths of the three angels of Revelation 14, it was based on how he felt and how people were treating him. Dark clouds of unbelief floated over his mental sky. He felt that everything was going by the board. Here was the elder's special weakness. He's a strong man in certain directions when all goes smoothly, but very weak in adversity. He failed to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In studying D.M. Canwright's life, this was the turning point right here. It was in 1873, actually. Dudley Canwright, from 1873 to his final defection in 1887, was in and out of Adventism, in and out of the message. But folk, it was this experience right here in 1873 that was the catalyst that eventually took Dudley Canwright out of the Advent message. Notice what happened. It's very fascinating. 1873, James White has already had one stroke. James White had gone to New York to get medical treatment. That didn't do very well because Ellen White was very disgusted with a lot of the things that went on there. So she took her husband to Colorado. The elevation would help, the fresh air, the exercise would help him out. While Elder and Mrs. White were in Colorado, Dudley Canwright and his wife Lucretia and their infant child went to Colorado with them. It says Elder White became so ill he could not sleep until after midnight. Folk, think about it for a minute. 
there were years when James White would hardly get any sleep at all because he was working during the day, he was writing articles at night, they would go traveling. That's why Ellen White said that James White died a martyr to the Advent message. James White, he took himself into the grave. Well, after one of his strokes, you see, he could not sleep until after midnight. He was very ill. The next day was rainy. There were too many people in a small space. One of them was a whining toddler. That was DM and Lucretia Canwright's child. This created tensions that developed into irritability and bitterness. Imagine Ellen White's trying to help her husband. Canwright and Lucretia are there, Dudley and Lucretia Canwright, and the baby's crying and screaming and carrying on. It was a recipe for disaster. Referring to the experience later, Dudley Canwright said, I told the elder that James White, my mind freely, that brought us into an open rupture. Mrs. White heard it all, but said nothing. Now that's from Canwright's book on page 42. That was such a prominent experience in Canwright's life. He wrote about it in his book. Mrs. White described it in her diary on that Monday and Tuesday. She and her husband talked with the Canwrights, but they both rose up and resisted everything that we said. I feel so sorry. On the night of the 12th, Elder White was again quite sick. His wife was up with him for hours. The same night, the Canwrights moved to the home of friends, brother and sister Tucker. That's from Ellen G. White Manuscript. Uh, I think it's June 10 of 1873. Or August 10 of 1873. Now, folk, not this meeting will we look at the council. But Ellen White and James White, especially Ellen, talked to the Canwrights about home duties, about the need for Canwright to help his wife at home. Now in our vernacular today, we'd say, well, you know, a man can help with the vacuuming. A man can help with the dishes. A man can take out the trash. A husband is to try to relieve some of the strain and stresses that are on the wife's shoulders in the home. That's the man's job. It's amazing to me. It, it is amazing to me. But it gives a, an incredible window into Canwright's character. That was one of the things Ellen White said to him. He rose up against it. That's not my job. That's her job. Another thing Ellen White counseled had to do with health. She said, Dudley and Lucretia, you guys are eating too much, way too much food. It's taxing your system. It's taxing your mind and your body. She said, there's got to be more exercise. That's what she said. Simple, wholesome, valuable advice so that they could be healthy, be a blessing to each other, and a blessing to people in ministry. Dudley Canwright was not happy. Not happy. Elder and Mrs. White labored diligently to help them. 
daily diary entries speak of prayer on their behalf, of letters written to them. Dudley and Lucretia returned for a short time, but they seemed unfeeling, as unimpressible as stone. Ellen White wrote, Manuscript 10, 1873. Finally, they left for Golden City. James White had been deeply wounded. He liked Canwright. It seemed to him so cruel to be pressed and burdened in his feeble health with the case of Elder Canwright. Husband and wife in their mountain retreat pleaded with God for relief, and relief was granted them. Canwright soon afterward took his family to California, where he came up very... He came very near to giving up everything. After working at a farm for two months, we're now in January of 1874, he starts preaching again. Letters passed between the two families. The Canwrights pondered the long testimony of counsel and rebuke Mrs. White had written them. Friend, I, I'm amazed, and you will see it when we read it in the uh, next couple of meetings. Ellen White loved, loved them and gave them such practical, precious advice. But Dudley Canwright didn't like anybody to cross him. Nobody crossed him. Lucretia's handwriting with her husband's editing shows their attitude toward Elder James White and the testimony. It says, I told, as I told you in my previous letter, they wrote, I'm well satisfied now. I did not treat you with due respect and reverence. I was out of place in talking and writing to you as I did. I did not endeavor to please you as I ought but was too unyielding in carrying out my own ways. We put an extreme meaning on what you said and were too sensitive over it. In view of the kindness and interest which you had heretofore shown for me, I did not show you proper gratitude. I regret this and would do differently another time. So in this writing, it appears that Dudley and Lucretia can write, they're sorry that they did not respect James and Ellen White as they should have. But folk, I'll tell you, as we continue on, Dudley can write, allowed what Ellen White said to smolder in his heart, and it, it just ate him alive. Ate him alive. Couldn't handle it. Well, 1874, the Canwrights and the Whites are found in California, and there was a reconciliation, at least at that moment in 1874. Again, Dudley Canwright. Throughout his life, even when he left Adventism, he would talk about his love for the brethren. But once he left Adventism, there was no love. There was no love for Ellen White. None. Canwright wrote... In the Review and Herald Extra of 1874, Canwright said, Ellen White has stood by her husband and aided him in this work. The Whites have lived in Battle Creek for 19 years. I've lived there. Know that no persons are more highly esteemed than they are. Anytime Ellen White speaks, she can have a crowded house more than any other speaker. At our annual state camp meetings where thousands attend, the presence and labors of Brother and Sister White are always earnestly called for and nowhere more urgently than Maine. No more devoted, pious, believing people can be found than those who have thus enjoyed the teachings and example of Sister White for the last 27 years. 
If she be a medium of Satan to deceive men and women and lead them away from faith in God, Christ and the Bible, it's about time such fruits began to appear. By their fruit ye shall know them. So Dudley Canwright, 1874, promoting the life and ministry of James and Ellen White. But of course that would change. 1877, Canwright said the same thing. I've heard Ellen White speak hundreds of times. I've read all her testimonies, most of them many times. I've never been able to find one immoral sentence in the whole of them or anything that is not strictly pure and Christian. Nothing that leads from the Bible or Christ, but there I find the most earned, earnest appeals to obey God, to love Jesus, to believe the scriptures, and to search them constantly. I've received great spiritual benefit, times without number, from the testimonies. I never read them without feeling reproved for my lack of faith in God, lack of devotion, lack of earnestness in saving souls. If I have any judgment, any spiritual discernment, I pronounce the testimonies to be of the same spirit and the same tenor as the scriptures. Dudley Can write, became a Seventh-day Adventist as a young man, became an evangelist. He loved the truth. He proclaimed it wholeheartedly. He had periods of despondency and doubt that almost carried him out of the Advent message. While he and his wife had a falling out with the Whites in 1873, Canwright had a deep respect overall and admiration and appreciation for the ministry of James and Ellen White. Now we're going to stop there today. We've come to 1877. Dudley and Lucretia Canwright seem to be right there on the Advent ship, preaching the Advent message. But as we'll see next week, God willing, uh, they eventually, well, Lucretia didn't, but Dudley eventually leaves the Advent message and becomes... Seventh-day Adventism's most ardent opponent. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you today that you pled that you worked for, that you agonized over Dudley Canwright. Thank you that you had a servant to speak directly to him in Ellen White, that she sought to save him from himself. Thank you for his life that serves as a warning to each one of us. You give us direct messages in different ways, through your words, through your representatives. Father, humble our hearts to be ready to receive truth in whatever guise it comes that will lead us in the way of life. In Jesus' name, amen.